How does language help us build our reality? I want to assume that it's very easy for us to understand, but what can you manifest if you're just thinking in positive terms? So think about the amount of time it actually takes to formulate a thought in your mind and then think it out loud to somebody else in a coherent way that makes sense for them. So you almost have to already assume that they have a certain understanding about the subject matter, for example, and that is important because they need to have some kind of reference for what it is you're talking about, and then that they understand it, and then that you both understand it in somewhat of a similar way so that there isn't any misunderstanding in what it is that you're trying to arrive at or communicate. So in the interest of brevity, I'm going to try to understand how best to use language from now on. And this is a personal struggle for me because as I mentioned before, um, I have been in a retreat for almost 12 years. Um, my life has been very, very minimalistic in the sense that I had literally almost no social life. It was just from work to home. And then at the time, my parents were kind of um, in and out of some kind of um, medical health needs, so just kind of in and out of hospitals and, and such. So it, it was very, very limited. So for me to think out loud about these ideas um, is kind of new. And I'm happy to, and I kind of look forward to some, some kind of feedback so that I can kind of engage with new creative ideas and we can kind of collaborate and think of the best way to make sense of our reality together. So uh, now that I may have the best intention around this and just from like the past few videos that I, I posted about uh, coming up against brick walls and in spite of the best intentions and knowing all the metaphysical truths of the importance of patience, being charitable with yourself, um, not getting caught up in the devastation of a difficulty and kind of just knowing when to step back and when to kind of revisit something and, and maybe have the forethought to think about why isn't this working for me and what is this trying to tell me and how can I change or modify my behavior or my aim so that I can maybe realign with some kind of uh, new direction and maybe meet the same goal but somewhat sort of modified. So I say this because when we're having these really big emotions, it's really difficult to remain patient and steady. We do. We really need to let that anger out. We need to, sometimes for me, I know it's like a, a litany of curse words and I mean, I just can't find enough words to kind of satisfy the angst that I'm in. And I, I'll slam things and I'll just like, I'll, I'll, I really need to vent that energy. Um, before this, like maybe four or five years back, I would spend so much time at the gym, like just really high intensity and just um, finding a way to exert whatever it is that my mind is having trouble grappling with. And f doing that is actually really healthy for our mental health because if we if we compress all that in, it will manifest in some form of unresolved. And sometimes it'll be mental health, sometimes it'll be actual physical illness. Um, because we do know that cortisol, once it floods your body, it, it almost eats away at your body. Like you'll have digestive problems, you'll have um, sore muscles. So whatever you do, if you're ever caught in some kind of cycle of unresolve, make sure that you find a healthy way to express that. Um, and if it is to find professional help, then definitely go with that. So this is kind of like a segue into why a spiritual path can be helpful because it can help us understand what these brick walls, as it were, are for and why are they there. From an Islamic perspective, it's typically that, um, going back in time, that when Adam was created, if you believe in the creation story, that uh, he was um, almost ennobled by God in the sense that I'm, God is saying, I've created this creation that has the faculty of discernment. And before that it was jinn, which is made of fire and smoke. And before that it was light um, in the form of angels. So it's almost like a subset, as it were, of God's light. Just very, very, very less concentrated. So the angels, all they do is they're just praise. They're there basically, their existence is a form of God's praise. So that's basically what their understanding of life is, or like what we can understand of them. So almost like separate of God, right? In the form of like a construct that's praise. And then outside of that, it's just jinn. And at the time, from what we can understand from the narrative, 
uh, I believe it's in the second chapter of the Quran, it's just strife. It's just conflict. It's destruction. It's, it's just like, mm, people are just like, if you believe in evolution or the big bang, it could be that like, it's just, who knows what's going on, right? We know that energy doesn't destroy itself. So it's just, we've got energy and then we have chemicals reacting and creating whatever it is that chemicals do when they interact and they're very volatile. So with that, um, when God is saying, I've created this new creation and I, I want to, I want to show the magnitude of its excellent relative to existence right now, because it has a faculty to, uh, to think things through and to know what the difference and how to draw similarities and distinctions between different items. And then based on that, make a choice and then think about how to reason what those choices might result in and then how I might react based on whatever like the multitude of scenarios are so imagine what that is right it's it's almost like a it's something now that has aim and it has focus so the story goes on to say that um the angels when, when God said I I've created this and he calls to the creation around him and says I want you to bow in honor of this new creation so the angels bowed and um, because it's almost like that's just their nature, right? It's like another form of praise of God. Whereas the jinn made a fire, refused. And what we know of jinn is that some of them are submissive to praise. Like they maybe thought about it in a certain way or they've heard praise and so it just resonated with them in a certain way. But not all jinn do. So now think of this as fire. Like think of this like massive dimensionless form. And if you've done chemistry uh, classes or you've had... <laughs> Uh, I don't know, the availability to work with different chemical um, elements. Sometimes you watch them react together and there's different shades, there's different like brightness and it's almost mesmerizing, right? So if you think of fire in itself, you can't define it in any way. You come too close and you just automatically instinctively like pull away for like self-preservation. So smoke coming out of that is already confusion. Like it's not going to be clarity, that's for sure. So it's almost to say that if I was Jin, for example, and I was told bow down to this creation, my instinct might be I want to rely on something that's mine before. Like I don't want to submit my intellect right away, right? So it's almost like I need that. There's like that. And you feel that way when someone asks you to do something and you're not convinced about it. You'll, you might do it if you're at work and you're like, you'll get in trouble otherwise. But there's a part of you that wants to resist and it almost feels angry that it can't, right? And I empathize with this because from an Orthodox tradition, even though I grew up um, in a way that didn't seem to really misalign with my nature, just because I am an introvert, so it was like, ah, staying at home was not really a big deal, I do that anyway. Um, but having somebody who is maybe more spirited or very outgoing and being constantly told to, you know, subdue yourself, remain uh, calm. And that's not going to happen. Like it'll just manifest in behaviors and outrage and tantrums and you know what, like ultimatums, it's not going to work. It's just going to create a mess. So from that perspective, if we understand that the importance of language is to help us create meaning, help us create understanding, and have that all resonate in some way that helps us um, create an emotional state that calms us or that somehow reassures us, then we understand why that faculty of discernment is something that's ennobling to us or for us and why the freedom of expression is important, why the freedom of thought is important and why we need that ability within us to be recognized. So for someone to just say, do this and you're not convinced of it, but it doesn't really matter one way or another because it's kind of just neutral, that's fine, right? And that's probably a majority of our existence anyway. Um, just like within a civic society, like follow the rules, follow the traffic laws. When you get in an elevator, you usually go to the back, so you make room for people coming in. Um, at a restaurant, if you're waiting to be seated, you know, you don't mind kind of waiting until somebody comes in and seats you. You know what, these common, like, um, they're almost no ones are givens in a society. And typically if you're traveling, you are sort of gravitating towards um, what's really at like a popular outing place just to kind of observe people and see you know what what is it that I need to pick up on that's a social norm here so there's no um, inadvertent like faux pas or like anything that might offend right so 
with this, it's, it's sometimes good to understand um, why a creation story or any kind of narrative, whether you believe it or not, or like if you want to think of it like mythologically, why it's important for you to kind of have to build some kind of foundation on for your uh, spiritual path or for how you want to understand how the universe works. So um, having an idea of why you need language and why understanding uh, different ways of communicating and why nuance is important is going to help you because the more meaning you gain from something, the more satisfying the answer is. And then it just becomes something you relish, just creating all these different nuances where it's not really comfortable for you anymore to just give a broad generalization about anything. So with this in mind, when you start to think of time and existence and how nature works, um, destiny becomes very difficult for us to wrap our minds around. And I empathize with this exactly because of what I mentioned in the past. Sometimes things happen and you almost want to give yourself an out. Like you want to give yourself an excuse. Like why, if it's out of my hands and it's predestined, like why don't I just go with it? And it's exactly that. Sometimes um, knowing that you are struggling with something for so long is almost its own indication that you need to try something else. And maybe this specific scenario for the specific time in this context, just the, it's not the right um, pieces of the puzzle for you at that time, as it were. So a scenario for me was when I was in university, uh, first year, because I was new to the social context, um, all these different niches that are kind of like subcultures as though like in a little world of its own and try to find where I want to fit in. And like, is there like a few that I want to kind of overlap with myself? I almost like just dropped school, like the cognitive, like the course <laughs> coursework load of it altogether. I was just so enthralled by it. like there's just so much happening and I and I want to kind of catch up with that that I missed like in my early developing years so at the time I was contemplating destiny and in my mind I felt bad about like my grades are suffering and I, I don't even know like is the university for me and because I was studying the hard sciences at uh at the beginning there it was it was almost like if my heart's not into it it's just like you you can't excuse me, you can't invest in something that's that much cerebral work half-heartedly, like either like it and you engage in it or you don't. So anyway, I dropped out the first year and then I went back a second year and just took a course load that was lighter and kind of like, um, kind of like an online approach just so that I'm not really <laughs> into the university culture as much. But it made me wonder, like, to what degree are we sacrificing our, our, our well-being and our development if we don't engage our dimensions holistically so if we don't think of our physical well-being our psychological well-being our cognitive well-being spiritually um kind of like metaphysically and then mentally and um i think i got all of them there but to understand the importance of that is almost to engage oh and socially is to engage with all of them in some form of balanced way so that you're not um, short shaving yourself some way and then kind of regretting it later so I created this, um, this almost, it's difficult to understand how I would even explain this, but I, I'm thinking about it, if you think in terms of the earth and the earth's core, so you have um, at, the, at the middle there is the end and the beginning of the tree of knowledge. So that is what in uh, tradition is called the low tree. So it's almost like this endless uh, amount of knowledge that any one person can have. Now think of all of creation and it's just like limitless. That's basically why it, God is known as the expansive. Like it's just constantly growing. Now outside of that, you have the next layer of earth, which would be time. So equate this with the actual earth. So this would be like magma and then a, a layer outside of that and a layer outside of that. And then outside we have the atmosphere. So time is sometimes the more I'm studying this, like within myself, I'm realizing that time can be cyclical. It's not necessarily in a dimension because time can constrict and expand without us really knowing. We can talk about that later. And then outside of that, you've got land and water. And what we know of water is that it can give life and it can destroy, right? So without life, we basically cease to exist. So we need the water to kind of sustain earth and humans and creation. But if things do get out of hand, then we have storms and everything just destroys itself. So. In a sense, it is like water. It's very, dif uh, sorry, like fire. It's difficult to kind of give it dimension, even if we know all the chemical characteristics or the elemental characteristics of it. So if you think of that as the pioneer, like this is like, let's assume this is the beginning of time. 
And as we're moving around clockwise, you've got technology and civilization. So it's just think of people trying to find a way to support their existence. So they're thinking of language, maybe um, what resources are available for them within their context, and then trying to grow with that. And typically, it we tend to do so in an entertaining way, maybe more so now than we can imagine in the future when it was originally just hunter-gatherers and nomads. Uh, it was mostly just survival and then falling asleep and hopefully not getting eaten the next day. And then the next one, the next stage would be the warrior self, which is basically a way to self-defend. Um, maybe uh, in North America with the founding fathers, it was the right to bear arms. So knowing that you can defend yourself until sort of we organically build a government that allows for human rights and property and all that to be kind of respected. And, and then we're back to pioneering again. So if you think in a person's lifespan, we typically are somewhere between trying to find a way and a resource um, in the world to support our existence. And then as we construct with time and like new ideas and in entertaining ways, um, we are building almost a self that has boundaries and can continue to renew itself backwards and forwards until we are finally uh, making a meaning for ourselves that we can uh, independently kind of own and embody. And then we're almost like a pioneer of our own existence. So we've got our unique identity kind of building itself. So if you think of destiny in that time, you can think of it in a way of, I want to manifest a certain uh, identity for myself or a certain existence or a certain goal. And then think about how can I use this circle to make that come to existence? Um, so with this, if you think of uh, someone who enjoys ideas in an entertaining way, you are already without the stress that typically hinders creative ideas. And the reason that stress can take away from uh, creativity is that it almost shuts down uh, our ability to want to engage with anything. So already we're not thinking outside the box or laterally, like everything, we almost like want to follow rules just to kind of get through something and then we're done. So trying to keep things kind of light and entertaining um, is a good way to kind of relax yourself and then your mind just relaxes and then you start to think really creatively about a new, uh, new idea. So with keeping this metaphorical spirit alive, I think is a, um, a good segue to allow poetry to be something you want to explore as well as music. So you can think of music without lyrics, especially after you've already heard the song. And then try to listen to just the instrumental and, and see what the difference is. Like sometimes because you've heard the, the song with the words, um, you already have a vibe for what the music is and like what the mood of it is. Um, taking away the lyrics is almost like, okay, so now I kind of have a feel for, I, I wish I had the words to kind of help me express what, what, the, what the mood of the sound of the music is. So all those ideas going together almost complete it in a way. But it's all already packaged, and for you, it's to kind of understand how does my context resonate with it. Now, poetry is the same thing, and what it is is that it's like a succinct way of understanding a group of words. And I want to, maybe because it's on a specific topic, I want to understand how I can make meaning for this. And so you can kind of add these different dimensions to it with your life context, with maybe your previous conscious history, where you want to go in the future. And the more you revisit this, the more it'll become something that you embody and then you can kind of move forward with. And the reason I, I choose poetry before scripture is because um, it's it's more flexible with you being playful with it. With scripture, sometimes you'll you'll come up, especially depending on your, your background and how flexible the environment might be. Some people might be very hesitant to allow you to be too flexible with some ideas, depending on what it is. So with poetry, it's easy. And then... Um, you can kind of overlap ideas and maybe become your own kind of poet. So understanding word use and the context is essential to identifying with a variety of meanings. And with that, you'll gain a lot more understanding of how nuance occurs in language and in existence. So after that, um, you can just try to understand and revisit the same text over and over. And as you do that, you'll as you move forward in time, you can reflect back and almost remember 
it'll just kind of resonate with you in kind of like a nostalgic way of like, look how far I've come and you'll create more um, interpretive new ideas for your life. So I think that's it for now. I'm going to leave you with a poem. Um, it's very postmodern and the way it's constructed and the words are. And I just want to kind of, I'm not going to give any commentary on it. Maybe in the next video I will, but it's just something for you to, to think about with regards to why sometimes people are hesitant to affiliate with the group or be preached to and, and how maybe that comes to uh, existence for some people after a little bit of time and hesitation. So the poem is by Sylvia Plath and it's called The Applicant. So first, are you our sort of a person? Do you wear a glass eye? glass teeth or a crutch, a brace or a hook, rubber breasts or a rubber crotch, stitches to show that something's missing? No. No? Then how can you give, then how can we give you a thing? So it's almost to suggest, do we have anything to offer each other? And so that's something that you can try to think about. Like, how would you want to understand that? And as I mentioned, we're not an island. So don't try to think that you do need to kind of separate yourself from the crowd um, without intending to engage again. So sometimes it's just good to have a blank slate with something new, just to kind of get your own impressions first. And then after engaging with some ideas or other people's um, understandings, then you can try to put the two together and assume like a new understanding that maybe something that's uh, feasible for you to kind of compare and contrast with. So that's it for today and see you next time.